you to turn just to begin with to Luke chapter two, 11, please. Luke chapter 11. And uh, the first few verses is what is typically called the Lord's Prayer, right? It's where the disciples have a, a meeting with Jesus and they say, Lord, you know, John taught his disciples to pray. Would you teach us also to pray? And so he does. You remember how that wonderful prayer begins that he outlines for us? How does it begin? Our Father. One of the most precious, is it name or title for God in all the Bible, to me, is Father. And we were doing a study in the um, eighth chapter of Romans here, the last uh, two services, and I just could not help but uh, think about that wonderful phrase where we are no longer in bondage to fear, but we are able to cry, Abba, Father, right? I want to uh, just preface that with a couple of statements. I have a little booklet here that, that uh, I don't know if I can even find the place. I forgot to mark it. I highlighted it. But anyway, it's a little book that if you like uh, theology, I recommend it. And it's, a, it's, it's theology proper. That is, it's about the study of God. And uh, when I read this year, uh, quite a few years ago now, it really brought me to worship the Lord. It's called Delighting in the Trinity. And uh, I don't know much about the, the author, but uh, I can recommend at least this book that he wrote, Delighting in the Trinity. Anyway, <clears throat> it really gives you a perspective of God as the Father that you probably never had before, and some of which I will share in this uh, in our thoughts today. I understand that there are people sitting here or people that will listen to this message either now or in the future that have had horrible fathers. I understand that. Um, maybe he didn't even know your father. Maybe he was totally, maybe he died before or left and you, you never even knew him. Here's something that I want you to realize. Earthly fathers earthly fathers are to mirror God the Father. God the Father doesn't mirror earthly fathers. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't look at your earthly father and think, oh, God's a father, that's how he is? No, it's the opposite. <laughs> earthly fathers are to mirror who God the Father is. And if they did, you'd have the best father on the planet. You really would. And I know some of you had good fathers and uh, and have good fathers, and you're very thankful for them. And uh, yet, if you've had a bad father, if your father was absentee, if your father was abusive, if you're a Christian, forgive them. Forgive them. Get over it. <clears throat> Forgive him. That's what Christians do. We forgive because we've been forgiven. A much greater, greater debt or just as great a debt as we would hold our fathers accountable for, right? So forgive them. That's what Christians do. They forgive. In fact, that probably is one of the finest marks of Christianity is it's godlike to forgive. Because it's not natural to forgive. It's unnatural. It takes the supernatural power of God to forgive. And so that's what I want to say to preface our thoughts about God, our Father. You know, it's a natural desire in the human heart to belong. To be a part of a, of a loving family. I think that that is a God-given desire because, and I say this reverently, don't misunderstand me, God's a family man, capital M. God is eternally the Father. 
in eternity, before there was time, before there was space, before there was even heavenly hosts created, obviously before there were humans, the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus, called the first person of the Trinity, Father. In fact, you remember John 17? Let me just jump back there and read it to you. John 17, this is Jesus's, this is the real Lord's prayer. John 17, and in verse 24, here's what he prays. He says, Father, I will that they which thou hast given me, that's you and me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Listen to this. For thou lovest me, Father, thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Before anything existed, before time and space, the Father loved the Son. He's the eternal Father. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. One God, we know, three persons. But the family unit, when you think of it that way, is really the more social reality than even the kingdom is. Originally, families began before there was time. And families didn't begin with human families. Families began with God. There was a parent-child relationship, so to speak, between God the Father and God the Son. In fact, the Bible says that God is a God of love. Well, in order to, for that to be his very nature, there has to be something to love. So what did he love before there was a creation? What did he love before there was a heavenly host or a human family or anything created at all? Well, obviously, we have the answer there in John 17, 24. There is a love that existed in the triune Godhead from all eternity. And so the family originated not in time, but in God. It's The family really is an eternal concept, not just a temporary historical one. All of us have families. People come in families. Why? Because God does. <laughs> and we're... God imagers. I could say something, but I'm not going to take the time. Well, should I? Islam has 99 names for God. One of them, he's the all loving one. There's a problem with that, however, because Islam doesn't believe in a triune God. And if he's one, then he needs a creation in order to be all loving. So before there was a creation, if he's if Allah is eternal, then he's not loving. Until there's a creation, then he's that's not his nature to love. And when you look at the Islam, you get the distinct impression he's not very loving. And so I say that because this is who our God is. And he puts us in families. In Ephesians chapter 3, listen to this. Verses 14 and 15, Paul's wonderful prayer in this chapter. He says, for this cause, I bow my knees, listen, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So before he's a father of anyone, he's the father of the Lord Jesus Christ from all eternity. And then verse 14 or 15, he says, of whom, in Christ, the whole family in heaven and on earth, in heaven. Heaven and an earth is named. So God has a earthly family. God has a heavenly family. And I'm convinced that the heavenly family is not just believers that are with the Lord currently. But I think the heavenly family are heavenly hosts. That God has a heavenly family of spirit beings. And he has an earthly family of human beings. Two families that I think are being mentioned there in, in that verse. So 
I say that to say this. Are you with me? Hey, if you're too warm in here, take your coat off. It's it's hot in here. And I don't want you dozing off because you're overheated. But um, I want you to get this, really. The overarching picture of the Bible is that God is a father, and he is the father both of a heavenly and an earthly family, and that family relationships between people exist because we are God imagers. There is God the Father. He's called Abba. And that's probably the most precious name for God in all of the Bible. Because Abba is what we called our good daddies. The, the fathers that we love, we call them daddy or, or papa. And that's what Abba means, okay? And then there's Jesus. And you know what Hebrews tells us? Are you with me? Don't get distracted. Hang with me. You know what Jesus Tell what we're told about Jesus in Hebrews 2. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers. You know, he's our elder brother. God's the father. Jesus is our elder brother. And as we talked this morning, you and I that know Christ, we're brothers and sisters. We're a spiritual family. We're God's earthly family uh, that he has brought together. So God's part of our family, and we're part of his family. And uh, that's really the pattern uh, for society and for the care of people, for families. And really, when you look in the Bible, you'll find that not only is that big picture of family life from Genesis to Revelation, but you also realize that God has designed it that the, the, uh, the elder man in the household the father is in charge of the whole household, the whole family. And it's the responsibility of the father to make sure that the needs of his family are met and that the people in the family, even in, in, ancient, in the ancient Near East, family was not just husband, wife, and the immediate children, but the extended family because they all lived together in community. And so when you have villages, for instance, in the Bible, they're probably all related for the most part. And so you have this extended family, and it was the, the, the patriarchs, the, the oldest the male, the, the head of the family, is his responsibility to not only care for his immediate family, but for his extended family. It was his responsibility to make sure that any family member that got off track, that, that ran away, that, uh, that uh, uh, had needs, regardless of how far they were moved in the family tree, that uh, if they were disenfranchised in any way or marginalized, that it was that, that father, that patriarch, that was supposed to reach out, rescue them, help them, and bring them back. He's called the, the goyal in Hebrew. It's a kinsman redeemer. It has much more to do than just with avenging a death or, or murder. It's the, the total responsibility. And then that responsibility passed on from the patriarch in that family to the firstborn son. And it became then his responsibility to pass that on to his firstborn. And that's how God arranged families in the scripture. Um, I wanted to share something with you about this picture of family life in the this book. It says, so... What, is, what does it mean that God is a father? It means that God is inherently outgoing, a life-giving God. Um, I, I think that's the only part I'll share at this point. But let's think about God as the father of a family, but let's think about him in creation. He's the creator. Why does God create anyway? I believe, and, and uh, uh, some of this, these thoughts come from this book, that creation is simply an expression of the Father's eternal love for the Son. That it couldn't be contained. The Father's love for the Son couldn't be contained, and so it overflowed in the creation of a human family that uh, he would place in God's earthly garden that we know as Eden, and that creation, the blueprint for creation, 
is that the father's overflowing love for the son is such that uh, the son becomes the firstborn among many brethren. That's what Hebrews tells us. So that's why creation. Creation is really the fountain of God's love brimming to the top and overflowing. And so we are the many sons or brethren of Jesus that he brings into the family. And then think about not only creation, but God's family. Think about redemption. The father, <coughs> the father's family becomes a bunch of prodigals. They waste their lives and they run away from God. By the way, the prodigal son, that, that, that uh, parable, that's, that's not about backsliders coming back to God. That's about sinners coming to Christ for salvation, coming to God for salvation. And so it's a picture of redemption because the father's family, all of us, we became runaways. And the father has done what a father should do. He's done everything necessary to bring us back home, to bring us back into the fold. And so he did so by sending and offering up his beloved son to be our Goyle, our human kinsman redeemer, is Jesus. And he then sent the Holy Spirit uh, to seek humans because God desires that we be part of his family and we live together forever with him. That's what he wants. That's what he's after. A family living together with the Father in what the Bible calls the New Jerusalem. We call it heaven, but the New Jerusalem eventually is down on a, on a whole earth that is like the Garden of Eden, right? So family. God, our Father, he has a family. And if you're a believer, you're a part of it. There's a second thing I want to say about the fatherhood of God, and that is that it is primary both in Ephesians uh, 3.14, as well as in um, Luke 11.2, when we're taught, when we are outlined how to pray, we're to pray our Father, because that's a primary relationship for believers. I think that not only is that precious, that God calls himself our Father and wants us to address him as our Father, but it's it's of first importance in Christian theology. I don't know if you realize just how influential the fatherhood of God is. The church leaders of the first three centuries emphasize God as father. And as a result, it influenced their work. It influenced their, their writings. It influenced their theology. It influenced their lives in a profound way. And so... They determined that they would pray that way. Uh, the early church literature, uh, liturgy rather, was that way. Uh, the doxologies are that. We don't say it. Some churches recite what is called the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. Well, the first point of the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in God the Father, because that is so basic and so uh, really essential to Christian faith. Um, I want to read another uh, page from this book. I have marked the, the page number. And um, here's what it says. <clears throat> Father, everything changes when it comes to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Here is a God who is not essentially lonely, but who has been loving for all eternity as the Father has loved the Son in the Spirit. Loving others is not a strange or novel thing for this God at all. It's the root of who he is. This is why the fatherhood of God is primarily the most important thing for us to come to grips with. Because before he was a king asserting his sovereignty, before he was even the creator, the source of all things, Beginning from all eternity, he was a father. And the best way for humans to think of and to connect with God is through this concept of the fatherhood of God, because that is a concept that carries with it reconciliation and healing, which is what we need. 
It's more personal and more powerful. God as father never diminishes any of his other roles. For example, a lot of the Old Testament really uh, centers on the fact that God is the judge. God's the final judge. But the best way for humans to think of and connect with God uh, as, uh, is as father, not diminishing his other roles. In fact, it helps us to understand his other roles better. For example, what difference does it make if the judge is your father? Now, I know he's impartial, but the judge of all the earth, he'll always do right, but he's a judge of mercy as well. The judge is your father. The creator is your father from all eternity. God is not, get this, God is not merely a person to be feared. He is to be feared. He is not merely a person to be feared. Our God is a father to be loved. Can I repeat that? God is not merely a person to be feared. He is a father to be loved. And when you love him as a father, you'll fear him properly as well. And there's a third thing that I want to say about the fatherhood of God. And that is not only the family aspect, and primarily that's the thing that really ought to be essential, but thirdly, that he is God the Father, speaks of the fact that he wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to know him intimately. Pray our Father intimately. You see, Jesus is the eternal Son of God. I know we read in Psalm 2, verse 7, Thou art my Son. Uh, today have I begotten thee. And that doesn't mean that he has not been the eternal Son of God. There's a different uh, meaning to that statement. Jesus is the Son of God. And in that, he... He enjoys a unique relationship, shares a unique relationship with the Father that we don't. However, through Jesus, human beings too become the sons of God. He is the Son of God, Jesus. We become the sons of God. Now that makes us God's children. You know, there's a sense that every human being is God's offspring, okay? Because he's the creator of all human beings. In that sense, we're his offspring. But in another sense, you are not a child of God unless you have been, you've undergone a new birth. You've been born again. Through, <clears throat> through the Son of God, human beings like you and I are privileged to become the sons of God. It necessitates a new birth that produces a new heart in us, and then we become new creations, which was what God intended us to be all along. And he begins from that moment that you're born again to put you and I back into being the God imagers that he intended us to be. We become conformed as we cooperate with the Spirit of God in our hearts into the image of, of Christ. And so it results, you become, you undergo the new birth, it results in a, in a new life. You become members at that moment of a new family. And uh, God is your Abba. Jesus is your brother. And you and I are family. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. As I said this morning, our human spirits are connected with Jesus, and so our human spirits are connected with, with each other. I have a spirit, my spirit is connected with your spirit if you're a believer. And let's just say my wife wasn't saved, then I would be connected with you more than I would be connected with her. See, this is this is why brotherly love is so important. Because it's more important than biological family life. It really is. Because you may or may not be living with your family forever. 
but you'll be living with your spiritual family for all eternity. This is vital stuff. And it's all about the new birth. And so God is Abba. Jesus is our elder brother. You and I are brothers and sisters or brethren in the Lord. And there is that self-giving love that uh, we mingle our life, not only with God, but with one another. And there develops an incredible personal relationship with the Lord and a closeness with God's people as we do that. Intimately, he is God our Father through the new birth. And you know what that ends up being? That ends up that we occupy a new home. The human family actually mirrors or reflects the inner life of God himself, the triune God and their love among themselves. And it teaches us intimacy that God seeks with you and I. Now, there is a uniqueness that God's people have with the Lord that no other human being has. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14, verse 23. He says that if you will follow me, he says we, meaning the Father and the Lord Jesus, and of course the Spirit is included in that. We will come unto the person that obeys and we will make our abode with him. We'll make our home with him. And the, the fact of the matter is the believer's heart becomes God's home. You have a new home. It's God's home. And God's home is your heart. God's home is you. And there is intimate fellowship there. The sad thing is, not many believers realize it and thus fully enjoy because it requires loving obedience that we can't do, but God provides the ability to do it as we trust him to produce it and express it through us. So in closing, I just want to share with you uh, just a true testimony of a Pakistani lady that her husband, I think, was a major figure in the government of Pakistan at one time. And she somehow was given a New Testament. And she began reading the New Testament. And what amazed her and what she thought was impossible, she read the New Testament, is that it was possible for people to begin their prayers, Our Father? That was so foreign to her thinking as a Muslim. Because the one thing she knew about Allah is that he was not like a human being. He was greater than humans and infinitely different from them. And so a human category could never be used to describe Allah. Certainly not as a person and directly as a father. And when this Pakistani woman got saved, which she did, her first response was to lift her heart and to say, Father. And the moment she uttered that, she felt completely terrorized because she thought, why, I can't say that. I'll be killed for that kind of impertinence by Allah. But instead, the Heavenly Father came to her. And the Heavenly Father, in all of his love and compassion, spoke one word to her heart, daughter. And when that took place, she just wept. She just wept uncontrollably at the realization that God in his sovereignty, in his greatness, could belong to her in such sweet fellowship and relationship. And so I say to you, seek God as your father as a good heavenly father that our earthly fathers ought to be like, but often aren't. But he's the perfect father. And uh, he wants to commune with you intimately. And knowing him as father is primary in the believer's life. And as a result of that, 
to really appreciate the spiritual family that he's put you in. 